Hey, my name is Freddy Savage, and I just got back from reading stories at the children's hospital. I told the most macabre and sadistic stories I could tell. Even I had a hard time telling them, believe it or not. My ways were being heavily questioned, and they, the MFs who run the place, demanded me to be escorted out. I expected such backlash from telling all these tales, but believe me, I did this in good faith. It wasn't just for shock value. By the end of my readings, a young boy with stage 5 terminal cancer suddenly didn't have it anymore, and he was granted a full life of longevity and good health. Multiple others were cured of their illnesses as well. It was a miracle, some would say. The parents hated me, obviously, for telling the most sick and twisted things that I could, like I had some sort of nerve. I think they're just being really ungrateful since Lil Timmy isn't gonna die anymore, Susie grew her legs back, and Lewis isn't sick. He's now sick. There's honestly something very healing that comes with horror. The doctors also really hate me now as well for single-handedly curing all of their patients since they're now losing out on all of that sweet revenue of theirs. But I guess they should have just been doing their jobs in the first place. It's not my fault I'm good at what I do. And all this... <laughs> surprisingly brings me around to today's story. I've told stories of fiction in the past and today I want to tell something true. It has to do with lobotomies and most notably the most famous survivor Howard Dulley. The history of lobotomies have always fascinated me due to the way how people treated the mentally ill back then. It was very much like the wild west in the worst way possible. Compared to today's standards everything back then would not fly for one second today. So you better dim the light lights because things are about to get dark. I hope you're comfortable because you're about to not be. This is Internet Campfire Stories Volume 4 Howard Dolly and the Lobotomy. On January 17th, 1946, a psychiatrist named Walter Freeman launched a radical new era in the treatment of mental illness in this country. On that day, he performed the first ever transorbital or ice pick lobotomy in his Washington DC office. Freeman believed that mental illness was related to overactive emotions and that by cutting the brain, he cut away these feelings. Just gotta, you know, like resort to the most drastic thing possible. Hey, you feeling a little depressed? Haven't gone outside to touch grass in a minute? Don't have a strong social circle? No sense of community? Don't go to the gym anymore? I got a more powerful thing for you. I'm just gonna snip your brain. Old medicine really baffles me, dude, and they're just like way of thinking. Freeman, equal parts physician, showman, and fuckboy, became a barnstorming crusader for the procedure. Before his death in 1972, he performed transorbital lobotomies on some 2,500 patients in 23 states. That's um, a lot of people. One of Freeman's youngest patients is today a 56-year-old bus driver. And when I'm talking 56, this article was written in like 2005, so you do the math because I can't. And he was living in California. Over the past two years, Howard Dolly has embarked on a quest to discover the story behind the procedure he received as a 12-year-old boy. Bro, 12 years old, that's so young. Like they say the brain stops developing at 25. His brain isn't even like half done developing yet and he's got a lobotomy. What the fuck? In researching his story, Dolly visited Freeman's son, relatives of patients who underwent the procedure, the archive where Freeman's papers are stored, and also Dolly's own father, to whom he had never spoken about the lobotomy. If you saw me, you'd never know I'd had a lobotomy, Dolly says. The only thing you notice is that I'm very tall and weigh around 350 pounds. But I've always felt different, wondered if something's missing from my soul. I have no memory of the operation and never had the courage to ask my family about it. So two years ago, I set out on a journey to learn everything I could about my lobotomy. Neurologist Igas Moniz performed the first brain surgery to treat mental illness in Portugal in 1935. 
The procedure, which Moniz called a lochotomy, involved drilling holes in the patient's skull to get to the brain. Freeman brought the operation to America and gave it a unique new name, the lobotomy. <laughs> what a drastic name change. So original, so unique. So much different from the last one. Freeman and his surgeon partner, James Watts, performed the first American lobotomy in 1936. Freeman and his lobotomy became famous, but soon he grew impatient. My father decided that there must be a better way, says Freeman's son, Frank. Walter Freeman set out to create a new procedure, one that didn't require drilling holes into the head, the transorbital lobotomy. Freeman was convinced that his 10-minute lobotomy was destined to revolutionize medicine forever. He spent the rest of his life trying to prove his point. With something as batshit crazy as altering someone's brain forever, maybe cutting a few corners and making the procedure shorter maybe just isn't the best idea going forward. Just a thought. As those who watched the procedure described it, a patient would be rendered unconscious by electroshock. Freeman would then take a sharp ice pick like instrument, insert it above the patient's eyeball through the orbit of the eye into the frontal lobes of the brain, moving the instrument back and forth. Oh my god. Then he would do the same thing on the other side of the face. Ugh, if there's anything to make me cringe, it's the thought of this, honestly. Freeman performed the procedure for the first time in his Washington, D.C. office on January 17, 1946. His patient was a housewife named Ellen Ionesco. Her daughter, Angeline Forrester, was there that day. She was absolutely violently suicidal beforehand. Forrester says of her mother. After the transorbital lobotomy, there is nothing. It stopped immediately. It was just peace. I don't know how to explain it to you. It was like turning a coin over that quick. So whatever he did, he must have done something right. Ellen Ionesco, now 88 years old, lives in a nursing home in Virginia. He was just a great man, that's all I could say, she says, but Ionesco says she remembers little about Freeman, including what he looked like. By 1949, the transorbital lobotomy had caught on. Freeman lobotomized patients in mental institutions all across the country. There are some very unpleasant results, very tragic results, and some excellent results, and a lot of in-between. From the sounds of it, there was just a lot of bad results. <laughs> Says Dr. Elliot Valenstein, who wrote Great and Desperate Cures, a book about the history of lobotomies. Valenstein said the procedure spread like wildfire because alternative treatments were scarce. There was no other way of treating people who were seriously mentally ill, he says. The drugs weren't introduced until the mid-50s in the United States, and psychiatric institutions were just overcrowded. Patients and their families were willing to try almost anything. Mind you, seriously mentally ill back then was considered like depression and anxiety and shit. Any money if I was born back in the good old days, my ass would have been lobotomized. By 1950, Freeman's lobotomy revolution was in full swing. Newspapers described it as easier than curing a toothache. <laughs> Get a load of this. Freeman was a showman and liked to shock his audience of doctors and nurses by performing two-handed lobotomies, hammering ice picks into both eyes at once, standing on his hands and using his feet, doing it with his eyes closed. You know, I just made both of those up, but I mean, like, I wouldn't put it past him to do any of those. He really was doing the two-handed lobotomies though, hammering both the ice picks into both eyes at once. In 1952, 
He performed 228 lobotomies in a two-week period in West Virginia alone. Dude, that's a lot of lobotomies in two weeks. What the fuck? He lobotomized 25 women in a single day. He decided that his 10-minute lobotomy could be used on others besides the incurably mentally ill. I mean, if you just wanted a lobotomy, just say you had a lobotomy for like the street cred and whatnot. Just line right up and get one. This guy. Anna Ruth Channels suffered from severe headaches and was referred to Freeman in 1950. He prescribed a transorbital lobotomy. Any opportunity he saw, this man took it. The procedure cured Channels of her headaches, but it left her with the mind of a child, according to her daughter, Carol Noel. It was just as Freeman promised, and she didn't worry at all, Noel says. She had no concept of social graces. If someone was having a gathering at their home, she had no problem with going into their house and taking a seat too. Howard Dolly's mother died of cancer when he was five. His father remarried and Dolly says, my stepmother hated me. I never understood why, but it was clear she'd do anything to get rid of me. Poor guy. A search of Dolly's records among Freeman's files archived at George Washington University turned up clues about why Freeman lobotomized him. According to Freeman's notes, Lou Dolly, the stepmother, said she feared her stepson, whom she described as defiant and savage looking. He doesn't react either to love or to punishment, the notes say of Howard Dolly. He objects to going to bed, but then sleeps well. He does a good deal of daydreaming, and when asked about it, he says, I don't know. He turns the room's lights on when there is broad light outside. Yeah, this man's a weirdo. Get him a fucking lobotomy. He's just a common teenager, Jesus. Man, people back then just like really baffle me. Like schizophrenia, for instance. You'd have schizophrenia back in the day and your whole family would be convinced you're possessed by demons. Next thing you know, you're strapped up to the bed with like an exorcist in the corner throwing holy water at you and shit. You're just like, man, that's just schizophrenia, jeez. Such a crazy time. I'm so happy we progressed past that. On November 30th, 1960, Freeman wrote, Mrs. Dully came in for a talk about Howard. Things have gotten much worse and she can barely endure it. I explained to Mrs. Dully that the family should consider the possibility of changing Howard's personality by means of transorbital lobotomy. Mrs. Dully said it was up to her husband that I would have to talk with him and make it stick. Then, on December 3rd, 1960, Mr. and Mrs. Dolly have apparently decided to have Howard operated on. I suggested they not tell Howard anything about it. In an entry dated January 4th, 1961, two and a half weeks after the boy's lobotomy, Freeman wrote, I told Howard what I'd done to him, and he took it without a quiver. He sits there, quietly, grinning most of the time and offering nothing. Dolly says that when Lou Dolly realized the operation didn't turn him into a vegetable, she got me out of the house. I was made a ward of the state. Dude, what the fuck? This chick needs the lobotomy on her, oh my god. It took me years to get my life together. Through it all, I've been haunted by the questions. Did I do something to deserve this? Can I ever be normal? And most of all, why did my dad let this happen? Yeah, why did his dad let this happen? For more than 40 years, Howard Dolly had never discussed the lobotomy with his father. In late 2004, Rodney Dolly agreed to talk with his son about the operation. So how did you find Dr. Freeman? Howard Dolly asks. I didn't, Rodney Dolly replies, adding that Lou Dolly was the one. She took you. I think she tried some other doctors who said, there's nothing wrong here, he's a normal boy. It was the stepmother problem. Why would a father let this happen to his son? Yeah, I'm actually asking the same questions here. We're on the same page here, author of this article. I got manipulated, pure and simple, Rodney Dolly says. I was sold a bill of goods. She sold me, and Freeman sold me, and I didn't like it. Dude, I 
it's so heartbreaking. I can't stand this woman. The meeting proves cathartic for Howard Dully. Although he refuses to take any responsibility, just sitting here with my dad and getting to ask him about my lobotomy is the happiest moment of my life, Howard Dully says. Rebecca Welch's mother, Anita, was lobotomized by Freeman for postpartum depression in 1953. After spending most of her life in mental institutions, Anita McGee now lives in a nursing home in Birmingham, Alabama. Rebecca visits her every week. She believes Walter Freeman's lobotomy destroyed her mother's life. Postpartum depression, dude. I've never given birth, obviously, since, like, you know, this. But like, that's shit that you get over eventually. That's something that you overcome. Like turning to a lobotomy to cure this. Bro. Can't get over the audacity and the sheer like God complex of this doctor. I personally think that something in Dr. Freeman wanted to be able to conquer people and take away who they were, Welch says. I hope he got what he deserves. At a meeting in the nursing home, Welch and Howard Dully find common ground in their experiences with Freeman. I'm happy for them for that. It does wonders to know that other people have the same pain, Dully says. Howard Dully's two-year journey in search of the story behind his lobotomy is over. I'll never know what I lost in those 10 minutes with Dr. Freeman and his ice pick, Dully says. By some miracle, it didn't turn me into a zombie, crush my spirit, nor kill me, but it did affect me deeply. Walter Freeman's operation was supposed to relieve suffering. In my case, it did just the opposite. Ever since my lobotomy, I felt like a freak, ashamed. But now, after meeting with Welch and her mother, Dolly says, his suffering is over. I know my lobotomy didn't touch my soul. For the first time, I feel no shame. I am, at last, at peace. Nice. After 2,500 operations, Freeman performed his final ice pick lobotomy on a housewife named Helen Mortensen in February 1967. She died of a brain hemorrhage and Freeman's career was finally over. Good for him, not for her. Freeman sold his home and spent the rest of his days traveling the country in a camper, visiting old patients, trying desperately to prove that his procedure had transformed thousands of lives for the better. Sounds like a whole lot of cope to me. Freeman died of cancer in 1972. Talk about a happy ending. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, that is so messed up, man. Having someone in a position of power like that, like he's definitely a narcissist with a god complex and also with like a taste for showmanship. It's not a good place to be at all. 20, like 2,500 lobotomies, that is so much. Especially when he said the like, some results were good, some were in between, some were bad, some were horrible. Like, that's so rough. So many lives he permanently altered and just like made worse in the end. So many people he tricked into thinking that this was gonna work for them, that this was like the cure-all thing for their mental illness. Especially in a time when there was nothing else available for them. They were just robbed of their sanity, robbed of themselves. That's so crazy, man. So sad. Also so crazy how Howard had his lobotomy at only 12 years old. Like, that's such a young age. How his stepmother just didn't like how he acted and was like, to get this kid a lobotomy he's not even my son even if he was your son that's just a big no 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 it really makes me so thankful just how much we progress as a society these past like 50 so years and how much of a deeper understanding that we have on the brain and the conditions that it can bring out inside people and how also as a society we're a lot more accepting of people who aren't just your like standard cookie cutter type citizens like you got to admit everyone weird as fuck nowadays and i love it i really just wanted to bring forth this story to raise awareness of the monsters that walk among us in the shiny lab coats the ones who lie and deceive to fulfill their god complexes through the unaware and the vulnerable the ones who give you false hope on giving you a better future on changing Changing who you are when in reality there's nothing wrong with you in the first place you all are just perfect how you are and I hope you remember that 
My name's Freddie Savage, and I hope you enjoy today's story. Have a wonderful night.